All right, so today we're diving deep into rotational motion, which I know you've been curious about. And lucky for us, we've got Richard Feynman's lectures on physics as our guide. Oh, Feynman, yeah, he's the best. Yeah. He could make quantum physics feel like a playground. For real, though. But don't let that fool you, rotational motion. It's deceptively simple. It's full of those little aha moments, you know, where you suddenly see how the universe operates at like a fundamental level. Yeah, it's like we see things spinning every day, but we don't really stop to think, Wait, how is that actually working? Exactly. And Feynman wastes no time throwing us a curveball right out of the gate. Chapter 20, he hits us with this idea of torque as a vector in 3D space. Okay, hold on. I'm trying to picture this. I get that torque is a twisting force like when I'm tightening a bolt, but how can a twist be an arrow pointing in a specific direction? It just it doesn't compute in my brain. You're right to question that it is counterintuitive. But trust me, it's crucial to understanding how rotation works in three dimensions. Think of it this way. Imagine turning that bolt clockwise. The direction of the torque vector wouldn't be along the plane of rotation, but rather it would be pointing straight out towards you following what's called the right-hand screw rule. So if I'm using a screwdriver, the direction the screw would move if I turned it clockwise is the direction of the torque vector. Mm -hmm. Cause that helps me visualize it. Precisely. Now here's where things get even wilder. This whole right-hand rule thing, it only works because we happen to live in a three-dimensional world. Feynman points out that if we were in a four-dimensional space, representing torque as a simple vector wouldn't work. The math gets a whole lot more complicated. Well, hold up. Are you saying our 3D world has this like hidden structure that makes rotation possible in this elegant way with vectors and everything? It's true. And that naturally leads us to another key concept, angular momentum. All right, hit me. What is angular momentum? Just like linear momentum tells us how much oomph an object has in a straight line. Angular momentum is all about an object's tendency to keep rotating. The faster it spins, the harder it is to stop. And just like torque, it's also represented by a vector. Okay, I'm sensing a pattern here. Everything's a vector, but how do we even calculate something like angular momentum? Good question. This is where the math gets a little spicy. We need to use something called the cross product, which is like regular multiplication, but for vectors. All right, break it down for me. What makes the cross product so special? Well, when you multiply two regular numbers, you get another number right. But with the cross product, you multiply two vectors, and the result is another vector. Whoa, that is wild. So we get a vector as an answer. What's the point of that? It's how we mathematically capture the inherent direction of things like torque and angular momentum. It's not just about the amount of spin, but also the direction of that spin. Think about oh. using a wrench again. The direction you apply force to the wrench isn't the same direction that the bolt moves. Yeah, that's true. It's like a perpendicular thing happening. Exactly. And that's what the cross product helps us figure out mathematically. In the case of torque, it's the cross product of the position vector, which tells us where the force is being applied and the force vector itself. Okay, that makes sense. But things are starting to get a little abstract for me. We've got all these vectors flying around. Are there different types of vectors? Great question. And yes, there are. Things like force and velocity, they have a clear direction in space, right? We call those polar vectors. But things like torque and angular momentum, which we get from this cross product operation, are called axial vectors or sometimes pseudo vectors. Pseudo vectors. Now, okay, that sounds intriguing. What makes them so pseudo? They have a direction, sure, but it's determined by this convention, this right-hand rule. They're not pointing in a direction like a force pushing on an object. They're describing a direction of rotation based on this mathematical convention. It's like they're a different breed of vector, these pseudo-vectors. Yeah. More conceptual, less about the direct push or pull. Exactly. And this seemingly small distinction has huge implications for understanding how rotation really works. Wow. So even something as simple as a spinning basketball has this hidden complexity, this angular momentum represented by a vector pointing in a specific direction. It's like looking at the world with new eyes. And that's just scratching the surface. This concept of angular momentum as a vector, it's the key to unlocking some of the most bizarre and mind-blowing phenomena in physics. Okay, now you've got me hooked. What kind of mind-blowing phenomena are we talking about? Well, let's start with something you've probably seen before, maybe even played with as a kid, the gyroscope. Ooh, the gyroscope. Yeah. I've always found those things strangely fascinating. They just seem to defy gravity spinning in midair like that. That's a great example, and it leads us perfectly into our next section. All right, the gyroscope. Okay, yeah. I'm intrigued. I remember playing with those as a kid. Totally baffled by how they seem to defy gravity. It's a classic physics demo. It never gets old. You've got this spinning wheel and it seems to just float there, you know? 
resisting any attempt to change its orientation. It's like it has a mind of its own. Totally. But you're saying it's not magic, it's just physics. Yeah. I gotta hear this. Oh, it's physics, all right. But the kind that feels like magic, picture this. You're sitting on a swivel chair, holding a bicycle wheel by its axle, and that wheel is spinning like really fast. Now try to tilt the wheel. What happens? Okay, I'm picturing it. I'm I'm guessing the wheel doesn't just tilt like I expect. You got it. Instead of simply tilting, the whole chair starts rotating. It's like the wheel is saying, nope, I'm going to keep spinning my way and you're coming along for the ride. That's wild. Okay, so where does the physics come in? I'm guessing angular momentum has something to do with this. You're spot on. Remember how we talked about angular momentum being a vector? Well, that spinning wheel has a whole lot of angular momentum pointing along its axis of rotation. Okay, so far so good. So we've got a spinning wheel, lots of angular momentum. Then what? What makes it move so weirdly? When you try to tilt the wheel, you're essentially trying to change the direction of that angular momentum vector. You're applying a torque to it. Right, because torque is all about twisting and turning, mm -hmm. and I am definitely trying to twist that wheel. Exactly. But here's where things get really interesting. Instead of the wheel just tilting over like you'd expect, that angular momentum vector starts to rotate itself. We what? The vector itself is rotating. We got it. That rotation of the angular momentum vector, that's what we call precession. And it's the key to understanding why the gyroscope behaves the way it does. Okay, so the vector is rotating, but what does that actually look like in the real world? Why does the chair start spinning? Think about it. The angular momentum vector is always pointing along the axis of that spinning wheel, right? So if the vector starts rotating, the wheel has to follow. And since you're holding the wheel, you and the chair get dragged along for the ride. Mind blown. So it's not defying gravity. It's just that the way it responds to that torque is totally unexpected. It's like it's playing by its own set of rules. Exactly. And those rules are all dictated by the laws of physics, specifically how torque, angular momentum, and this thing called precession all interact. Okay, I gotta ask, what about that weird wobble I sometimes see in gyroscopes, especially spinning tops? What's that all about? Ah, you've noticed that. That wobble is called nutation moke. Feynman describes it as the gyroscope kind of overshooting as it tries to settle into that steady processional motion. So it's like it's trying to find its balance wobbling back and forth before it finally smooths out into that steady circular procession. That's a great way to think about it. It's all about the gyroscope trying to find its happy place, its most stable state of rotation. This is blowing my mind. So we've gone from torque as a vector to this crazy spinning dance of the gyroscope. What's next? Well, we've only scratched the surface of rotational motion. Feynman doesn't stop there. He introduces another layer of complexity with something called moments of inertia. Moments of inertia. Okay, that rings a bell, but it's a little fuzzy. Moments of inertia. It's one of those physics concepts that feels like it's lurking in the back of my brain somewhere. Refresh my memory. What's the deal with moments of inertia? In simple terms, it's a measure of how resistant an object is to changes in its rotation. Think about it like this. A heavier object, or one with its mass spread out far from the center, is going to be harder to get spinning than a lighter, more compact object. Right. That's basically what the moment of inertia is telling you. So like a bowling ball is going to have a much higher moment of inertia than a tennis ball, even if they're spinning at the same speed. Exactly. And here's where things get really interesting in the world of 3D rotation. Even for the same object, the moment of inertia can change depending on which axis it's rotating around. Wait, what? You're blowing my mind again. Give me an example. Think about a basketball. If you spin it on your finger, it's going to have a different moment of inertia than if it were spinning end over end like a football. Okay, that makes sense. Hmm? The mass distribution is different relative to the axis of rotation, so it's going to affect how resistant it is to changing its spin. Hmm. But how does this all tie back to the gyroscope? Good question. Feynman uses this brilliant example of a lopsided wheel to illustrate this point. Imagine a wheel with a big chunk of mass stuck on one side. Now, when that wheel spins, it's not perfectly balanced. You get these internal forces, these centrifugal forces, trying to pull the mass outward. Okay, I can picture that. It's like the wheel is trying to shake itself apart as it spins. Exactly. And those internal forces, they create these internal torques that try to align the plane of the wheel with the axis of rotation. So it's like the wheel is constantly trying to find the most stable way to spin to minimize those internal stresses. You've got it. And this is where the concept of principal axes comes into play. Principal axes. Hit me with it. Every object, no matter how weirdly shaped it is, has three special axes called principal axes. 
These axes are all about finding those sweet spots for rotation. Sweet spots, you say? Intriguing. When an object rotates around one of its principal axes, its angular momentum lines up perfectly with its axis of rotation. It's the most stable, most comfortable way for that object to spin. So it's like these principal axes are the object's preferred spinning directions. Exactly. Now, when an object is forced to rotate around an axis that isn't one of its principal axes, like our lopsided wheel example, that's when things get interesting. Remember those internal torques we talked about? Mm -hmm. They're constantly trying to nudge the object towards rotating around one of those principal axes instead. So it's like a constant battle between the force rotation and the object trying to find his happy spinning place. That's a great way to put it. And understanding these principal axes along with the concept of moments of inertia is crucial for really grasping the complexities of how objects rotate in three dimensions. I have to admit this whole deep dive into rotational motion has been quite a ride. We've gone from basic concepts like torque and angular momentum to these mind-blowing ideas of precession mutation and principal axis. It's amazing how something as simple as a spinning object can be so complex. It really highlights the beauty of physics. We can describe these phenomena mathematically with equations and vectors, but there's still this element of wonder. It's like we're peeling back the layers of reality, revealing this hidden dance of forces and torques. And that's what Feynman was so brilliant at conveying that sense of awe and curiosity about the universe. He never lost sight of the fact that even though we can calculate how things work, there's always more to discover, always deeper layers of understanding to uncover. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. So for those listening, if this deep dive has sparked your curiosity, I encourage you to check out Feynman's lectures on physics yourself. You won't regret it. It's a journey into the heart of how the universe works, told with clarity, humor, and a contagious sense of wonder. And on that note, we'll wrap up this deep dive into the fascinating world of rotational motion. We'll catch you next time for another adventure in knowledge.